Remaining abducted Federal University due to male female students regain freedom. Reactions trail World Bank's recommendation on fuel subsidy. Controversy trail Taraba fire disaster. And on the international scene, funeral held for Al Jazeera journalists killed in Israel airstrike. Oh, hello there, and welcome to the News Hour at 9 p.m. on Trust TV. I'm Sagir Ibrahim. Thanks for joining us. We start the news this evening with security. The management of the Federal University Dutin Katina in Katina State on Friday said the remaining four abducted female students of the university have regained their freedom. The vice chancellor of the university, Armaya Ohamisubichi, who confirmed this to newsmen uh, in the state, said. On Friday, said the remaining four abducted students uh, regained their freedom, among others. Uh, he said that they were abducted by suspected bandits on October 3rd from their rented apartment behind Mariamu Ajiri Memorial School in Dutenma. Hamisubichi disclosed that the freed female students would undergo medical checkups before they are handed over to their families. Recall that on October 3rd, 2023, the police confirmed the kidnapping of five female students by gunmen suspected to be bandits. And on November 20th, the Katina Police Command confirmed that one of the female students had escaped from the abductors. Well, we now have our reporter from Katina, Abdullah Yamadi, joining us to give us more details on this development. Yamadi, welcome to the News Hour. Can you tell us, because in the statement released by uh, the Federal University, it was not stated whether it was a rescue operation or whether it was ransom being paid, you know, before these girls were released. So what do you know so far? Well, thank you very much for being there for us. Uh, the female students were freed uh, following series of persuasions from the Office of the National Security Advisor in Abuja there. And uh, according to the Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Aramaya Uhami Sibichi, uh, not a dime was paid uh, as a ransom, either by the government or the parents of the abductees uh, before regaining their freedom. And uh, of course, the freed students, like you said, are uh, already in Abuja, uh, undergoing some checks and observations. And uh, from what I learned from the vice chancellor, uh, the freed students will be reunited with their parents and uh, other members of their families uh, in the coming days. Uh, the vice chancellor. Uh, of the Federal University of uh, also said uh, the entire university community uh, is thankful to God and uh, the Office of the National Security Advisor for making sure that the abducted uh, female students were freed and hurt. Uh, and of course, uh, from what we have learned, uh, this situation has uh, restored the confidence of parents and the entire residents of the state, uh, especially on the commitment and uh, resilience and, of course, political will of the government in restoring peace and ensuring uh, uninterrupted uh, academic activities in our tertiary institutions. So, in a nutshell, uh, the uh, female students have been released, of course, like you said, and uh, all is well uh, for now. Okay, so uh, Yamadu, what do we know around you know the security arrangements around the university since uh, the release of these students? Have, has it been beefed up? What do we know exactly? Uh, already uh, days after the abduction, uh, about three months ago, uh, the security situation of the university has been improved, and uh, from what we learned, uh, the the institution has made an arrangement of uh, taking its students to the new site of the university and bringing them back uh, to the uh, old site on daily basis. So uh, apparently uh, you can glaringly see security uh, improvement at the, from the gate of the university. Uh, and of course, in and, in and around the university uh, community. 
So the situation has been improved, honestly. All right, Yamadi, um, before we let you go, so the Nigerian army and the Nigerian military generally has been, you know, taking the fight to the bandits in recent times. I mean, we saw the headlines about uh, Ali Kachala and the likes. So you're in Katsina State, around the northwest where these issues are. Can you give us a feel, you know, about what the people think or what they are feeling? Are there fears? Do they entertain any concerns around, you know, the military's fight against the bandits, the way they are doing it currently? Well, uh, there's a very serious uh, synergy between security operatives in Katana, uh in recent months. And of course, that has yielded a very, very positive result. Uh, the security situation has uh, improved. And uh, uh, let me say it uh, uh, clearly that uh, since the commissioning of the state security uh, community security watch uh, call. We have seen a, a serious improvement in security situation of the state because these uh, young men, they are fully aware of the terrain of their communities. They are aware of those that are engaged in uh, banditry. And of course, they go all out to hunt both the informants, the bandits, and all other criminals in their community. So we have seen a very significant reduction in uh, insecurity and criminality in Katmanot, honestly. All right, then. Thank you very much, Abdullah Yamadi, Trust TV reporter in Katsina, for this update. And please do stay safe as we touch base with you subsequently for more updates on the situation. Okay, thank you much, Sanfiani. All right, moving on now. Residents of Yelwa community of Shendam local government area of Plateau State are decrying the impact of a collapsed bridge on the community. Three years after the collapse of the bridge, nothing has been done to provide succor to residents who have been calling for help from both local and state governments. Trust TV Adomusa sent in this report after a visit to the community. Take a look. Like many communities battling under development, Yelwa community until 2020 rely on Gadam Pandam, as it is popularly called, to link with other villages for social economic activities. According to the members of the community, the collapse of the bridge has disrupted economic activities, adding that farming and commercial transactions with neighboring villages have become complicated. They explain that, apart from the impact on commercial activities, Primary and nursery school students who used to cross the bridge no longer find it easy to get to the school, especially during rainy season. They said it is dangerous due to the flowing water along the bridge. The, the collapse of the bridge affected so many things. It affected us, you know, in terms of businesses, in terms of farming, in terms of transport. Managing the bridge, we have already done our best in terms of managing it before it collapsed like that. Before then, there was a school here in some these areas. Students are going there, more especially during rain season. They used to follow this inside the water. The collapse of this bridge, in fact, it, it, give, it contributed for a lot of things. It deprived from doing other things. If you collapse the bridge now, automatically there is no any there's no any communication between we and the farmers and the people here around here in Tali. And it causes us a lot of things. Residents are, however, calling on the local and state government to reconstruct the bridge. Our call to the federal government, state government, and whosoever is in charge, that they should please come to our aid. This is a very busy area. It's a very big business area. Yellow is a very big community. We have so many businesses that are going through in this town. And this road, this bridge, links to so many businesses. Let them come to the aid of this community. Now, now we are calling the federal government and the state government. They should please help us. But this bridge, it, it, it brings us a lot of problems. The collapse of the bridge is not only affecting the movement of the motorists, but also pedestrians who engage in everyday socio-economic activities. How soon the government will respond to the plea of the people remains to be seen. Adom Musa, Trust TV News, Joss. 
Also, Nigerians have been reacting to the recent World Bank's advisory urging the federal government to stop further subsidy payment and increase the price of fuel to 750 naira per litre. The bank's lead economist for Nigeria, Alex Sinet, had during his presentation of the Nigeria Development Update, December 2023 edition, titled Turning the Corner from Reforms and Renewed Hope to Result on Wednesday in Abuja, gave the advisory. Trust TV's Ibrahim Ismail spoke to some residents of the FCT, including commercial tricycle operators, uh, popularly known as Keke Riders, on the World Bank's advisory and brings us their reactions. Take a look. 39-year-old Masoud Ibrahim is already struggling to remain in business amid the current harsh economic condition in the country since the removal of the fuel subsidy in May this year. The task of feeding his wife and four children has been very challenging. With the recent World Bank's advisory for Nigeria to increase pump price to 750 naira per litre, the father of four is afraid that the already bad economic condition will become worse. It cost more than 5,000 naira to fuel my KK. Before, it used to be 1,500 naira only. Passengers should be ready to pay more. The petrol price should be reduced. I am afraid a lot of KK operators may be pushed out of business if the fuel price is increased. Masood, who argued that the only thing ordinary Nigerians were enjoying was the fuel subsidy, asked the Tinibu administration to reverse the subsidy removal with food prices and transport fares at record highs citizens have been forced to shelf holiday plans this yuletide with this development abuja residents have been reacting to the recent recommendation by the world bank for nigeria to increase the price of petrol to 750 naira per liter you can't just move the fuel, uh, the price of the fuel from 250 to 750 uh, 50 naira. It, it, it doesn't make sense. It will tell on the citizen. As it, as if you look at the situation of the country right now, you you can see that the situation the situation is not is not, is not something to write home about. Six something. Can you imagine that? How can we be comparing our 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 economy with the economy of the world? And when we are fuel producing nation, it's crazy. I mean. See. This recent advisory by the World Bank, which advised Nigerian government to increase price of petrol to 750 naira, is already sparking reactions across the country. But the concern is that Nigerians are already battling harsh economic conditions, and nobody knows what people will go through if a price of petrol per litre is being increased to 750 naira. And some KK riders have already packed their own KK and other vehicle owners as well have sold out their vehicles because they cannot afford the prices of petrol in the country which now sells above 600 naira. This, whether Nigerian government will implement the advisory by the World Bank, nobody knows yet. Ibrahim Ismail, Trust TV News, Abuja. Thank you, Ibrahim. And the Nigeria Labour Congress, NLC, has labelled the World Bank an enemy of the country after the financial institution asked the federal government to stop the subsidy payment on petrol and raise the cost of the product to 750 naira per litre. In a statement, the Congress's chairman, Joe Ajero, criticised the World Bank's lead economist for Nigeria, Alex Sinat for supporting the unwarranted recommendation during a presentation in Abuja and rejected an increase in petrol prices to 750 naira per litre, while accusing the World Bank of promoting policies that prioritize foreign interests over the well-being of the Nigerian people. The union advised the government to resist foreign influence in economic policies and prioritize the welfare of its citizens. In the face of soaring inflation and increased transportation costs across the nation, Nigerians gearing up for Christmas 
a New Year celebration say their plans of the season have been significantly impacted on. Lagos State, Victoria Tokolo, re told reports rather that transporters who are grappling with a substantial decline in passenger patronage due to the rise in fuel prices voiced their concern. Her report is presented from our studio. At Ojota Motor Park in Lagos, a good number of commercial vehicles sit idle awaiting passenger patronage. The substantial increase in fuel prices has profoundly impacted the transportation business nationwide, dissuading many citizens from embarking on the usual festive journeys for Christmas and New Year celebrations. Instead, they have opted to dispatch their goods to loved ones via a way bill, choosing not to undertake the journey themselves. Several transporters who decry the situation highlighted the adverse effects of the exorbitant fuel prices on their operations. Christmas and New Year, traditionally peak periods for transporters, has seen a decline in demand. Previously priced at 118 naira per litre, fuel now stands at 600 naira per litre in Lagos. The cost of a trip from Lagos to Ibadan, which once consumed 5,000 naira fuel, has surged to 20,000 naira fuel for a round trip an indication of the profound economic strain they endure. Um, the buses are quite, um, are quite just it. They don't travel as usual. You cannot see the other two right now. One like the um, last year or last two years. As, 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 as of now, you will not see anybody bus here. There won't be any bus. Everywhere we share, you see passengers will be begging them to hold on, hold on, we'll be calling them. Where are you, where are you going now? Something like that. Right now, if I'm traveling to London, Last year, my pro and con for the learning is let's say 16,000 and up for 18,000. But for this year, the money is 55,000 and up of way. So, any amount we collect this year is free. Reducing of the vehicle in the park, uh, it is the increment in the fuel. You see, we are put the point for one ride to five minutes before. You can see the increment almost on spot. But now we are basically something. something. Financial strain has increased the cost of travel from Lagos to a war from 4,200 naira to 7,200 naira. Similarly, the route from Lagos to Akure, once priced at 3,500 naira, now requires 5,500 naira. Some passengers reacted to the situation. It's not easy anyway. Everybody has to pay for the transport. So, for the to for the 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 the for the for the for the for the for the in light of these challenges, transporters appeal to the government to intervene in order to alleviate the sufferings on the masses. Well, there you have it. Nigerians speak on the impact of the fuel price increase. Moving on now, troops of Operation Hadrin Daji have killed three terrorists and also rescued six kidnapped victims in Sokoto State. The Nigerian army disclosed this in a Friday statement, saying the development followed an onslaught against the terrorists. The offensive clearance operation, which took place at Boni Village and Boni Forest, led to a gun drill 
that lasted for several hours, the army said. The statement said the troops' aggressiveness and firepower superiority forced the terrorists to abandon their hideouts and flee in disarray. It added that two AK-47 rifles, 19 magazines, ammunition, two Dane guns, motorcycles, radios and other items were recovered from the terrorists. And in Anambra State, the police have rescued four children from the same parents who were abducted from their homes on Friday night. Anambra State Police Command spokesperson DSP Tochukui Kenga said the children were taken from Enugu Agidi in Njikoka local government area of Anambra State. Speaking on how the children were kidnapped, Ikenga said the mother of the children said the family was watching television at about 10 p.m. when electricity suddenly went out. She and her husband went out to find out what was amiss when they saw three gunmen suspected to be herdsmen and fled for their lives. By the time they summoned the courage to return to the house, they discovered that their four children were already asleep who were already asleep had been abducted by the gunmen. Ikenga said security had been beefed up in the area to forestall a recurrence. Also, the district head of Serkin Kudu town in Ibi local government area of Taraba State, Ali Hakimi, has been killed by bandits. Hakimi was killed after he was reportedly attacked in his palace at Serkin Kudu town at about 12.30 a.m. on Friday. A resident of the town, Bello Adamu, told Daily Trust that the deceased was the brother of the chief of Serkin Kudu chiefdom. Adamu said the bandits had launched several attacks across the chiefdom and abducted several residents recently. He noted that the attackers escaped into the bush after killing the district head, adding that everyone in the area is living in fear. The state police command is yet to confirm the incident. And also no fewer than 10 shops were reportedly raised by an early morning fire in Jalingo, the Taraba state capital. The incident which occurred at effect in the fire incident damaged properties and money worth more than 10 million naira. The incident which occurred at the roadblock area with no recorded human casualty reportedly destroyed properties worth millions. The report. According to eyewitnesses, a drum of fall from a truck belonging to black marketers and laden with over 30 drums of fall fell off the truck and ignited a fire. According to them, the fire service security personnel prior to the arrival of the fire service chased people from the scene of the incident to ensure that criminals did not capitalize on the incident to steal. They added that with the combined efforts of security men and first responders, the fire service contained thigh inferno within an hour. Yeah, you see, uh, when situations like that happen, I think uh, there should be emergency response from uh, the fire service unit on which it wasn't possible here. That was why you have this kind of uh, serious uh, destruction here. You see, it started at a very light highway and because of non-presence of uh, fire fighting you know personnel that is why at the end of the day you have this serious uh, destructions here some of the affected shop owners commended security personnel for warning of thieves who would have taken advantage of the situation to perpetrate crimes but lamented the slow response from the fire service black market the incident happened when black marketers were offloading fuel from a truck and one of the drums mistakenly fell, spilled its content and exploded. The explosion ignited a fire that led to the loss of properties worth over 10 million naira. And all of us are running. Some run from back, some run from front. Before people come gather, as they gather, some they bring water, bring uh, omo, and they, by then we call for this uh, fire service. Uh, they no come. Before they come, everything have already nearly to finish. Then people, even at last, make, uh, the police people come, fire, start firing some people, beating some people to ten. Some. Uh, 
black market sellers come to load their field to carry it to the village. So on the process of loading it, one of the, the drums filled, filled down and it landed. So from there, the fire burst out. Yes, we really appreciate the effort of the police, but the fire agencies have not tried a lot at all. Because on their arrival, they didn't tell anybody what is going on. They didn't tell us that they have uh, water or they don't have water. They just come and left without saying anything. We tried by inviting commercial uh, water sellers, water tanks. So we made an effort to meet two of them. So we called them and with the effort of the youth, they were tried, they tried and quenched the fire. Like seriously, like mine, a cash that I lost is about 850,000 Naira. That the one that I know, apart from the goods that I has in the shop. They called on relevant agencies to intensify efforts to get towards fire prevention to avoid future occurrences. And joining us now via telephone to give us more information about the fire outbreak in Taraba earlier today is the State Controller, Federal Fire Service, Taraba Command, Assistant Controller of Fire, Yakubu Dungus. Welcome to the program, Assistant Controller, and good evening. Can you please take us through the sequence of events today and it's how it almost became you know, controversial. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, what really occurred uh, is we were prevented from carrying out our responsibility at this uh, extinguishment of fire by some hoodlums uh, because we were in call on time and on arrival, they started pelting stones, throwing uh, Giants at every other item and us. So we decided to, as a matter of our principle, decided to return back to the station because our fire truck is bought by taxpayers' money, very expensive, and the safety of our officers is also important to us. That was why we decided to return back to the station because the hoodlums were terribly attacking us. They never allowed us to do our job. So that was why we left. We wanted to extinguish the fire because that is our major responsibility. So we weren't allowed. So we didn't just return to the station because we never wanted to fight the fire. We were prepared, we were hired for that, and that is our responsibility. But if the environment is not safe for us, the first thing to do is to return to the station. And that was what we did. Okay, so properties worth millions of Naira have been destroyed. Um, perhaps if they didn't, you know, launch the first attack or impede your activities, perhaps maybe there would, there would have been a lot of these items that would have been saved. However, from your expert opinion, what would you say uh, is the cause of the fire and what should be preventive measures to ensure that this don't happen again? Uh, from our preliminary investigation, we were informed that uh, flammable materials, especially petroleum and diesel gas, are being uh, hoarded because there are a lot of black marketers around the area where the fire occurred. And uh, we had some information that improper disposal of cigarette butts, because it's a beehive of activity, almost a bottle pack. So someone told us reliably that it was uh, an irresponsible uh, addition uh, of cigarette butt that caused the fire. So um, uh, the, the storage of the fuel, uh, this flammable materials allow, around that area is also not proper. There should be a proper way of storing them so that next time, because this is the second time this fire had occurred in this year around the same area. So I think there is need to store the flammable materials uh, properly in oh. order to avoid uh, reoccurrence. Okay, Mr. Controller. So I, I really, really wanted to ask questions around regulations and safety measures because like you alluded to, this is 
a continuum. It, it happens yearly. Uh, last year, we saw uh, situations of this same incident. This year, earlier this year, we saw the same thing happen in Meduguri, in Sokoto State Market, where, you know, unexpectedly overnight, you come in the morning and you see that the fire has raised, you know, the properties of Nigerians who strive every day to make ends meet. So, are there regulations or should there be regulations? Who should be held accountable or responsible when things like this go on? And how can you know Nigerians be protected from issues like this from happening, especially overnight, where there's little to nobody in these places or these premises to forestall fire outbreaks such as this one? Yes, there are regulations on ground. We have the National Fire Safety Code that is being implemented by fire officers all over the country. What we usually do is to go to business premises, public premises, and enlighten uh, the public on fire preventive measures and to ensure compliance with the National Fire Safety Code. We have been doing that. We have achieved greatly in Tarama because from inception, we have recorded later fire incidents. Though we still record fire incidents, especially like this one, unfortunately, but the regulations are on ground and we are implementing them. So we are calling on the general public to ensure compliance with the National Fire Safety Code as being implemented by all Federal Fire Service commands across the country. Because doing so will help in averting such kind of losses. Unfortunately, any time fire uh, outbreak occurs, if losses have to be there. It leaves its mark, and the mark is not a favorable one. That's why fire prevention is cheaper than firefighting. Mm. Indeed, fire prevention is cheaper than firefighting. Assistant controller uh, of the fire service, Yakubu Dungus in Taraba State. Thank you so much for joining the news hour this evening and giving insight on the issues. Thank you for having me. Moving on now, the clamor for justice and accountability over the military bombing in Tudumbiri that claimed the lives of more than 100 people continues to grow as Tijaniya grassroots movement calls on the federal government to follow the ongoing investigation to a logical conclusion. Have a look. While addressing journalists, the group call on religious groups and non-governmental organizations to join forces in fighting for the victims of the tragedy by holding the government accountable until justice is served. Report of the incident by panel of investigation should be made publicly available within two weeks of the formation of the committee. Sharing of assistance received should be distributed with all honesty and fear of Allah to the affected persons. According to the group, Tudumbiri community is in their need of urgent support from all quarters, especially the government, which has pledged financial and material support in the aftermath of the tragic incident. The issue of traumatize, as you said, everybody is obvious. Those people have been traumatized and pledges have been made. And that is why we are calling on the state government and even the federal government to find a means of collecting all these pledges that have been made to a central cause whereby what is need to be done to these people is being done. Here in Kaduna, we have no any other government than the government of Kaduna State. And that is the government that we are going to pressurize to make sure that all these pledges are being bring it together so that we can be able to see it. And at the same time, these people are benefited from the pledges. And this is what we are trying to do. The Nigerian had announced the commencement of investigations into the accidental bombing in Tudumbiri as pressure continues to mount on both the state and federal government. Bella Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. You're watching the news hour on Trust TV. Coming up shortly. Call for stringent penalties against perpetrators of sexual assault increases. This and more after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. If you're just joining, this is the news hour on Trust TV. Here's a recap of some of our major stories. Remaining abducted Federal University Dusima female students regain freedom. 
and reactions trails World Bank's recommendation on fuel subsidy. Moving on to more news now, an Islamic scholar in Ibadan, the Oyo state capital, Ali Temitokwe Abdul Salam, has urged governments at all levels to urgently consider the inclusion of Quranic and Arabic studies in the curricula of primary and secondary schools across the country. Speaking at a Quranic memorization ceremony, the Islamic teacher suggested that inclusion would favorably contribute to societal uprightness and address the recalcitrant behavior among youth. Here's the report. This is a gathering of students, Islamic scholars, dignitaries, and leaders of thought who have converged on Nigeria's premier tertiary institution, the University of Ibadan, to give more bite to the promotion of Islamic studies and its memorization. Speakers at the event are advocating the inclusion of Quranic studies in school's curriculum, helping to promote positive societal values. Some of the speakers are urging parents to pay more attention to the education of their children and ward as they attribute the moral decadence in society to the breakdown of family values. The stakeholders are charging attendees to promote sound education while urging government to put in place policies that can tackle poverty. We have to come again. We need a lot of spiritual diets for children of today because we have a lot of the tools of Shaitan that is all around the student to lead them astray. And that is why we started this institute. So that students, the youth, the Muslims, the Muslim youth will be able to come, memorize the Quran, learn about the truth of the Quran. Whosoever can live his life with what the Quran has come to teach, and that person will become someone that will be pious and righteous. You can be a doctor, you can be an engineer, you can be a pharmacist, you can be a minister, you can be anything. The moment you live your life by the Quran, it will be easy for everyone around you to feel the impact. A total of 114 students were presented with certificates having completed the full memorization of the Holy Quran. Society will become better. In a boarding school, and memorizing the Quran has been my mom's prayer, but I didn't have it in plan, but Allah has already seen it for me. And coming from the north or to the um, western part of Nigeria was not an easy decision. I left my parents and everyone. I came here with my sister. It was not easy at all. Yahoo, yeah, yeah. um, taking of drugs, stealing, and all those bad um, things. So I've learned, come to learn. Because in the Quran, they are mentioned in the Quran in plenty of places that all these kind of things they are not good. They are not things that we can do. So when someone memorizes the Quran, you come to understand from the meaning of the Quran, the Holy Quran, you come to understand that. I come to understand that all these kind of things are things that are not, you are not supposed to do. And even for me to memorize the Quran, for you doing that kind of thing, you will be feeling there is a guilt you feel. Organizers of this event are calling on employers of labor not to discriminate against youths seeking employment based on their religious background. Also, the number of resignations in the River State Executive Council has risen to nine after two more commissioners handed in their resignations following seven of their colleagues out of Governor Siminalai Fubara's cabinet. The latest to resign are the Commissioner for Special Projects, Emeka Woke, and the Commissioner for Environment, Austin Ben Choma. While Woke served as the Chief of Staff to former Governor and current FCT Minister, yes, on Wike, Ben Choma served as Commissioner for Urban Development in the immediate past administration. Woke was also a former local government chairman for Emohua, local government area. Also, the Labour Party has dropped its petition against the election of River State Governor Sim Fubara, the candidate of the People's Democratic Party in the 2023 poll. The party had challenged Fubara's victory in the exercise with the appeal court in Lagos, dismissing its petition and upholding the PDP candidate's win. But weeks after the development, Labour Party's governorship candidate in the election, Beatrice Itubo, this Saturday said the party has dropped the case. According to her, the move followed deliberations with Governor Fubara as she also pledged her support for the current government for the prosperity of the state. The synergy between Fubara and Itubo is the latest plot in river state politics amidst the political crisis rocking the oil-bearing state. 
while well, Ichibo had vowed to pursue the election petition to the highest length, insisting that the governorship election process was fraudulent. Labour Party's most recent move is believed to be connected to the strain between the governor and his predecessor, Yesom Wike. Also, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has moved all documents and materials used in the November 11 Kogi State Governorship election from its headquarters in Lokoja to Abuja. INEC Chairman Mahmoud Yakubu was said to have ordered the removal of the election materials from its Lokoja headquarters for security reasons. The electoral materials were transferred in INEC trucks on Friday afternoon from its Lokoja office under heavy security in line with the directive of the commission. The materials transferred to Abuja include election results, BVAS and other relevant sensitive documents as used in the election. Uh, an INEC official who craved anonymity said the order is to ease the smooth operation of the Kogi State Governorship Election Petition Tribunal sitting. The electoral umpire had earlier relocated the sitting of the State Governorship Election Petition Tribunal to the National Judicial Complex, Jabi Abuja, because of the alleged insecurity situation in its headquarters in Lokoja a few weeks ago. Also, reactions have continued to trail the refusal of the Supreme Court to release the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB, Namdi Kano. According to residents of Oweri, the Imo state capital, the continuous detention of Namdi Kano is not doing any good to the nation, especially the southeast, where his incarceration has caused security breaches. And moving on, President Bola Tinubu has felicitated his predecessor, Muhammadu Buhari, on his 81st birthday, hailing him as an icon of truth, justice, and patriotism. Tinubu also described the former president as a true reflection of sacrifice, devotion, patriotism, and fidelity to national cause. In a message of felicitation released on Saturday by the special advisor to the president on media and publicity, Ajuri Ngelale, President Tinubu extolled the leadership credentials and feats of the former president, recalling his meritorious service to the nation at various times as head of state and as president. He described the ex-president as a man of absolute and undiluted integrity whose yea is yea and nay is nay. Tinubu appreciated former President Buhari for his friendship and vote of confidence shown through his support for the administration while <clears throat> for the administration rather. Also, stakeholders have called for more stringent penalties against perpetrators of sexual crimes and promoters of gender-based violence in the country. This, they said, will guarantee the protection of the rights of all, especially women and girls. The report. Cases of sexual assault across the country have assumed a worrisome dimension in the not-too-distant past. Just last year, no fewer than 1,500 cases of suspects were recorded, including a Nollywood actor, Babai Jesha. In Ibadan, the Oyo state capital, residents are not comfortable with the trend. As a mother, as a female, is that they should give them death sentence. At least it will serve them right and it will curb the heart. At least it will reduce the, the, the occurrence. What is, what is bad? It's not good anywhere. Socially, rape or raping is, uh, is socially wrong, is spiritually bad. Um, any, from any angle you can look at raping, it's not a good thing. I lived three years or nine. I don't kill them now. How should you be raping a three years girl or nine years girl? So, I don't kill them. Also give their life in jail. Wife of your state governor and gender protection advocate, Tamunomini Makende, while lamenting the trauma on victims of sexual assault in any society, cautions perpetrators to desist or be ready to face severe sanctions. We had a girl that was gang raped and iron, hot iron was placed on a private part. 
we're talking about severe cases. And this is the reason why sensitization, work against sexual based violence is so pertinent to my heart. It's no longer something like the city said should be swept under the table. We have gotten a lot of cases here, especially this molestation of children and by relatives. I think we have some cases just like I told them when we were having it there. We have about 73 cases we have recorded this year. And we've sent about 62 cases to court. They are still being prosecuted. 11 are under investigation. For these 62 cases sent to court, we have 83 suspects. They are also standing trial. So we have all this that we just, the warning we're giving in New York State, for example, any case of child molestation, be it by the father, be it by the father, by the brother or whatever, shall never be swept under the carpet. Meanwhile, the police in the state, through the CP Adebal Amzad, has assured that security agencies will ensure that perpetrators are apprehended and made to face the full weight of the law. You're watching the news on Trust TV. The news continues after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The African Development Bank, AFDB, says about $90 billion is lost to theft of public resources each year. A loss, the body says, has prevented Africa from reaching its full potential as a continent. Trust TV correspondent Shamon Dabeng reports that the AFDB says losses incurred via theft of public resources and illicit financial flows as well as corruption in the continent has exposed Africa to volatile markets, prices and highly vulnerable supply chains. Here's her report. Corruption in Africa has stood in the way of the continent's growth as theft of public funds has left very little for African nations to properly plan and budget for its citizens. This has affected Africa's human capital indices on many fronts. African countries seem not to be budgeting enough for their, for their, for their citizens. Of course, that also harks back to the issue of uh, revenue mobilization, but not only that. It's the conceptual framework behind governance that needs to be fixed. For example, Nigeria's budget per capita is one of the lowest in the world. Budget per capita at the federal level is about $165, which probably cannot do anything. According to a recent report released by the World Bank, Nigeria has topped its debt list with $2.9 billion in fresh loans, while Tanzania came second with a $2.7 billion debt. Several developing African nations have been plagued with heavy debt, with a large chunk of its GDP set aside to service debt. The issue of debt has been subject to debate, especially in Nigeria, with arguments about the country's borrowing, the relevance thereof. The chief economist and vice president on economic governance and knowledge management at the AFDB, Kevin Orama, says over 21 countries in Africa are facing debt vulnerability, noting that urgent solutions are needed to prevent vulnerable nations from falling into crisis. You know, because before you only start discussing Afri uh, you know, countries' debt when they are already in crisis or when they are near crisis, and then the IMF do, will do debt sustainability analysis and start creating the warnings that you are close to debt, uh, debt, debt, uh, a debt challenge. And once you are there, it already creates a vicious cycle because the cost of debt, the cost of capital will go up. Once investors begin to feel that you are likely to default, then the risk that they have to take in order to give you more capital to do both capital and recurrent expenditure in countries becomes higher. So you have what you call the Africa, Africa premium that uh, countries pay in order to get capital to do, to do development on the continent. The issue of illicit financial flows, the AFDB says, is just one of the various economic challenges plaguing Africa as the continent faces budgetary issues, exchange debt with several African nations, spending over 50% or more of their GDP on debt servicing. Chamun Dabeng, Trust TV News, Abuja. 
Many thanks to Chairman for that report. We will now be joining Chair Maka Wafo for more on business news. President Bola Tinubu has assured foreign investors of ease in the repatriation of funds as the federal government ramps up efforts to attract more businesses to the country. The president spoke on Friday when he received letters of credence from the ambassador of Hungary, Loran Endurfi, the High Commissioner of Rwanda, Christoph Bazivyomo, and the ambassador of Ukraine, Ivan Kolenstenko, at the State House in Abuja. The Nigerian leader told the Rwandan High Commissioner that issues around trapped funds are being tackled, promising the funds will be processed expeditiously for release. According to a statement from his spokesperson, Ajurin Galali, President Tinubu said Nigeria is already working on streamlining issues of double taxation to ensure business growth in Nigeria, which he said is home and a haven for investors. The Federation Account Allocation Committee has shared the sum of 1.088 trillion naira to the federal government, states and local government councils. A communique issued at the end of the FAAC FAC in Abuja on Friday indicated that the allocation came from November 2023 Federation Account revenue. The 1.088 trillion naira distributable revenue comprised a distributable statutory revenue of 376.306 billion naira, distributable value added tax revenue of 335.656 billion naira, electronic money transfer levy revenue of 11.952 billion naira, and exchange defense revenue of 364.869 billion naira. According to the communique, total revenue of 1.6203 trillion naira was earned in the month of November 2023. The communique indicated that from the 1.088 trillion naira total distributable revenue, the federal government received a total of 402.867 billion naira. The state government received 351.697 billion naira, while the local government councils received 258.810 billion naira. A total sum of 75.410 billion naira, that is 13% of mineral revenue, was shared with the benefiting oil producing states as derivation revenue. From the 376.306 billion naira distributable statutory revenue, the federal government received 174.908 billion naira, the state government received 88.716 billion naira, and the local government councils received 68.396 billion naira. A total turnover of 1.882 billion shares worth 31.630 billion naira in 33,020 deals was traded this week by investors on the floor of the exchange. The financial services industry, measured by volume, led the activity chart, followed in second place by the services industry, while in third place was the consumer goods industry. The NGX all share index and market capitalization appreciated by 1.18% to close the week at 72,389.23 basis points and 39.613 trillion naira, respectively. 53 equities appreciated in price during the week, 32 depreciated in price, while 70 equities remained unchanged. And that's it on Business News. I am Chiamaka Mwafo. And on the international scene, dozens of journalists took part in the funeral on Saturday for an Al Jazeera cameraman killed in an Israeli strike in the south of the war torn Gaza Strip. Samir Abu, Abu Dakar's body, bearing his bulletproof vest and helmet, was carried through a crowd in the city of Khan Yunis before being buried in a grave dug by fellow journalists. His mother, Um Mahar Abu Dakar, accused Israel of targeting journalists, especially those working for Al Jazeera. Well, we'll go on a quick break now. The news continues afterwards. Stay with us. Welcome back. And now to sports. The back-to-school junior golf tournament has teed off in Abuja. The tournament is holding at the TYB Golf Resort, Mambila Barracks, in the nation's capital. Trust TV's Adeniya Jishafe has more. 
Over 60 junior golfers gathered at TYB Golf Resort Mambila Barracks in Abuja in the second edition of 1808 Foundation. The is creating a platform for young talents in golf by bringing them together to keep them mentally and physically alert before they resume for school activities. At the teen of the young golfers took to the course to show their skills while competing in different groups. The young golfers were full of joy while showing off with their skills at the tourney. 12 year old Zika Chart gave insight into the gains of playing as a junior golfer and call on keys to key into golf it's really fun and interesting and also it brings about exposure to a child and also it also makes um, children know more have more friends and also be able to enjoy the game it's a very good game it helps in your physical life your your fitness and everything. Lady Captain TYB Golf Resort Staff Sergeant Maureen Apute said kids are prepared for life by playing golf as it toughens them against life challenges. Golf is a, is a game of the mind. It's all about calculation, honesty, sincerity. For you to play golf, you need to be a gentlemanly person. Golf has really improved the kids. Because on several occasions, we've had our young ones here where players, um, senior, the senior ones, get into the course, maybe misplace their phones and important items. And you find these children returning it back. So that, that means they've learned a lot about being honest and um, being sincere. Joseph Onos, among other things, believes the event has created a better opportunity for young golfers to improve in all ramifications. All our young um, golfers will be in the world ranking. You know, so we are excited about that. They are going to be playing 52 holes. You know, so as it is empowering the young minds and also using it to promote back to school. You know, so most of the children are playing back to school. Most, some of them are playing for peace. The junior golf tournament. And with that, we've come to the end of the news hour. Do well to follow us across all of our social platforms and join our live stream for more news, programs, and documentaries. I'm Sakir Ibrahim. Good night.